Hello, everybody. Welcome to Free Kiwis. Today, we're delighted to have our friend Dane Giraud with us. Not for an interview like last time, but for our Free Kiwis book club number two, I think. Number, and today, number two, yep. And it's today, right. our book is Free, Free Speech, Speech, A Global History from Socrates to Social Media by Mach- Jakob Umchangama. Mishigama. Mishigama. Mishigama <laughs> is how he pronounces it in the... In the film last in, in, night. In the film. Maybe yeah. we should just briefly mention the film yeah. that we, we all saw last night. Okay. Sponsored by the Free Speech Union. And Dane, you were involved in, in fact, making this movie. He's the director, producer. Producer and director. I made it, uh, it was basically a collaboration between my company, Tummer and George Records, and the Free Speech Union. So yes. we, we shared those production duties. Jacob was coming over here for a tour, and you did a fantastic podcast with him, didn't you? We had a lovely time with Jacob. Yeah, he's, he's, he's right. a great guy, great guy. And uh, I, I had the idea when I knew we were bringing him over, I thought, you know, it would sort of be bang for buck if we made a, almost like a concert film or a tour film mm. of the experience, you know. And, and that's what we did. So we just had, I, I got a fantastic crew who I think, as you could see, on the, it looked, I think, quite amazing on the big screen. Very good camera crew and stuff. And we, uh, yeah, we followed him around. The only regret is that we probably didn't get enough, you know, people in... In, in conflict with him in yeah. terms of the pro-censorship side. But I don't want to, you know, having said that, I don't want to sort of short shortchange the film because that's the climate that we're in. That's right. And I, <laughs> I thought you did a great job in the circumstances with getting what oppositional voices were prepared to engage. The um, the chap from the Islamist society, for example, or the Islamic society. Yes. Uh, that was a good debate. And I, I think... Yep. You gave him a lot of airtime, so nobody could accuse that you of making a, a partisan film or, or one that didn't give fair play to the the other point of view. No, and I think Abdur Khan is is the, the right. name of the gentleman, the spokesperson yeah. for FIAN's Federation of I think National Islamic Associations. He was probably a bit suspicious, you know, because there's a lot of negative <laughs> press out there about the Free Speech Union. Well, they're actually, to be fair, there's no, there's not really a lot of negative press, but, uh, you know, a lot of people who are very partisan and on one yeah. side of this debate do like to mischaracterise us. It's a bit of a sport, I think, for them. Yeah, it's, but, more, um, it's more of a background hubbub than a... a, a yeah, yeah, than, yeah, than press. But, but you know, he, he saw it and, and, and said, oh, wow, you really gave me the floor. You know, I, I'm not afraid of the debate. Of course. Well, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's what it's all about, it's of all course. Of, and yeah. It is a shame that people like Paul Hunt, who is supposed to be you know, the for, foremost spokesperson for human rights in New Zealand is, is unwilling to front up over what is, what I think all of us would agree, the most fundamental of human rights being free speech. Well, he, he'll meet with the mongrel mob, but he won't meet with us. So that means that we're more badass than the mongrel mob. Now, that's pretty good. <laughs> I'm it's sure. kind of strange because... Any, any uh, mongrel mob listening, uh, you know, that's not a challenge. <laughs> He's the human rights commissioner, right? He is. Yeah. So it's funny because free speech is enumerated specifically as a human right in the UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights and also in the New Zealand Bill of Rights. So, you know, it's got a fairly good pedigree uh, as far as kind of being a human right is concerned. So it's very strange that he won't engage. I, I don't think he looks at human rights in that way. And I think that's a, a bigger issue, maybe for another conversation. But I think that there's a lot of freestyling and there's a lot of, a lot of people that will tell you that they support human rights have quite an Orwellian spin on it. Well, yeah. Um, I mean, I I actually think that the concept of human rights has undergone, you know, what's known as concept creep, which is to say it's gone out into all sorts of directions that are not really properly called rights. And I'd even say that the UN Declaration suffers from that a bit. Mm. So, so for example, it it includes a, a right to education. Now, I think it's extremely desirable that everyone has an education, but I don't think it's coherently called a right, to me, a right is something that you have unless you're actively deprived of it rather than something that has to be provided by the state or some such. So mm. I'd prefer to say people have an entitlement to education or entitlement to, you know, warm, dry housing or whatever. Mm. But I would prefer to keep rights to those things like free speech and association and, and, and the like. Yeah, so you might call those sort of negative rights, right? right? So it's yeah. sort of freedom from state interference and you speaking rather than positive rights, freedom yeah, exactly. to do certain things. Which are just encouraging a, a larger and larger, more intrusive state, uh, really. I mean, that's where, yeah, well, where, that's right. where that stuff goes. And, and yeah. uh, that then, you know, the bigger the state, I think the less the rights. That's, know, that's, the, that, whole, that's the issue. Yeah, exactly. yeah that's it's, the Orwellian yeah. spin. You know. 
No, no, but so we, yeah, we, we, for, for the people that wouldn't front up, I think we still cover them in the documentary. And uh, we, that, that was, that's the climate, isn't it? So, you know, so we captured that. So, no, it was, it was good and it was a good showing. And we're going on a nationwide tour now. So, and then, you know, hopefully there'll be, we'll find a home for it somewhere. But it might be a bit, bit of a controversial documentary, which is ridiculous when you think about it. But, you know, that's where we are and we'll, we'll see what happens. It wasn't that long ago that I remember, you know, groups who wouldn't come on the news and wouldn't actually willingly engage in debate. That was seen as like a big tell. Like it was seen as a very bad sign if you wouldn't do that. So I, I, I do think it's very strange that people like Paul Hunt won't engage. I mean, especially because Free Speech Union now, I mean, how many subscribers do you have? Something like 80,000 or something? Well, or? Uh, yeah, I think it's close so to 100,000. So it's a fairly big yeah. group. It's not like yeah. it's a complete no, like, no, fringe organization. Yeah, we're almost like an alternative human rights commission at yeah. the moment. Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, if the, if the Human Rights Commission won't do its job, then someone else has to. Well, that's what is happening. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, it might sound a bit presumptuous of me, but I, I think that's that's what... Oh, people are looking at us to... to um, I think if you've got 100,000 New Zealanders behind you, it's not presumptuous at all. It, mm. it, it's, a, it's a big clue as to what's really going on. And, and, and it's very encouraging that that many people are kind of w- woken up to that. And I think, I think that's what we saw happen during the hate speech debate. And having defeated the legislation, it's now been taken off the table, as most listeners probably know, I think it was good... To have that debate, I'm I'm glad in a way that it it came up and that free speech was threatened in the way that it was because I I strongly believe that we need to be reminded of its importance and the reasons why we need it to underpin democracy and open society and it's all too easy to take it for granted. So yeah. if someone comes along and threatens it, then those of us who love it dearly, we'll have to band together and, and remember why it's so important and articulate those reasons. Well, there's a lot of um, principles and values and so forth that, and, and even um, issues, topics, that we do have to keep re-examining. One is like, say, for instance, Holocaust denial. There are a lot of people out there that, that'll just say, well, ban them, these people that are going to deny it, because, I mean, it's settled. But I think the, the issue with a free speech society is nothing is ever settled. Right now, yeah. and what I mean by that is, like, you know, I'm Jewish, obviously. Uh, I don't like Holocaust deniers, mm. but our swords have to be sharpened constantly. You know, that's, that's that living in a society that, that's free. These things will always come back, and we we have to be prepared to debate them. Now, the irony is that if we're not prepared, or if they were banned, or if we never heard from them again. Uh, you know, the memory of the Holocaust could slip away. And a lot of the, you know, like uh, a, a person like me may not have a head full of facts eventually on, on, on topics like this. So it's, you know, it's an opportunity to educate. It's an opportunity to dip back into history. But, you know, you see a lot of weariness from people of like, why are we even going there? This thing is settled. Mm. It's like, I don't think anything is ever settled in a free society, and that's the mm. point. You know, we you got to be ready. Any historic topic could just come at us. Like in thirty yeah. years' time, we may be blown away what by what people are, are, are arguing about. They may be arguing about Napoleon for some reason. <laughs> right, and the other thing is, you don't you don't change anyone's mind by shutting them up. No. Whereas, you, I mean, for sure, you know, Holocaust deniers have some very strange ideas, and God knows where they got them from. But at least if you can talk to them, and they can talk to you. First of all, you know who they are, and secondly, you stand some chance of changing their minds if you're able to engage them in a, a kind of open way. And shutting them so. down deprives you of the opportunity of laying out quite how much evidence there is for that historical event. I mean, I'm an ancient historian, yes. so I'm used to like little scraps of papyrus and little little bits of stone with Greek on them. And you know, the, the evidence for the Holocaust is just so overwhelming that it you know it is good to actually have that debate. And this is another key thing that. You know, because you know the evidence is so overwhelming, I can tell you're not particularly intimidated or scared of the idea of debating a Holocaust denier. Mm. And for me, that's often another tell. Like when people won't argue, it kind of puts this seed of doubt in my mind. Do they do they really know what they're talking about? Are they really confident in their position? Right. Yeah. So what you've done just there is a perfect example of someone who kind of, you know, knows where they stand and is isn't afraid of debate. And I think that's uh, over a thing. You know, that is obviously hugely offensive to to people of your religion Mm. and so that's the other part of it is being willing to confront something offensive 
in order to have the debate. And that's the other thing that seems to be lacking a lot of the time. Can I just make a note? This is actually a good segue into the book, actually, because you were just talking about the universal, the UN Universal Declaration on Human Rights. And there is actually a section in Jacob's book about this. And it's a very interesting one because apparently when they were framing the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the USSR were pushing to add an article about hate speech, effectively. Yeah. They wanted that in. And what happened is that what we used to call the free world, so the US, Britain, and other countries like that, Western European countries, were against inserting a, a hate speech uh, article. And, and it seems from what Jacob writes that that was virtually kind of unanimous on the, on the side of the free West, that nobody wanted a hate speech provision. So I don't know, for me, I mean, this may be kind of guilt by association, but I think it's like sort of revealing that, yeah, the USSR was the country that wanted hate speech and the yeah. UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And now in the free West, the supposedly free West, a lot of people have suddenly become converts to this idea of hate speech. Mm. It's very strange. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's just. It, well, it's you, you, you alluded, Dane, to historical amnesia. You know, the 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 fact that if say Holocaust denial was suppressed, that the memory of the Holocaust could slip out of people's experience. Mm. Yeah, and I think you know to some extent, something like that has happened. I I actually think that the Second World War, in particular, and all of the totalitarianism that was confronting the free world and had to be defeated from from the holocaust to to you know the the horrors of the russian front and the 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 blitz on britain and all of those things galvanized the free world so much that mm. even when i was a child in the 1970s it was like it happened yesterday yeah and and it was very very much alive in public discourse and how dangerous totalitarianism and authoritarianism were and of course we had the contemporaneous lessons from the the Soviet Union at the time mm. when I was a child as well, but now you know it's more than thirty years since the fall of the Berlin Wall, and a generation has grown up without that mm. memory, without that being a, a kind of strong part of their experience as, as children, and I, I think we have got a bit of a historical amnesia and. I, I think, you know, Jakob goes into this in his book a bit with the, with the idea of free speech entropy, that the kind of natural state of humans is to slip away from that, and, and so we've got to somehow actively maintain it. But mm. I worry a bit that without these historical lessons to really keep us on our toes, that's a very hard task. Yeah, well, the, the, I mean, the interesting thing about history, and, you know, and you're a historian, James, so, you know... I'd like to hear your feedback on it. It's like, I tend to feel, and this is something I heard Kamal Paglia say, and I, I found it really interesting, like being religious, I'm not orthodox or anything, but, you know, I, I, I'm quite connected culturally. You know, we don't live in the past, but we're very aware of the past. My children knew who the Romans were <laughs> when they were four or five because it's part of the Jewish story. You know, they, they, they know a lot of these markets, you know, and a lot of religious people tend to have that sort of uh, maybe a, a longer memory, you know, because, uh, you know, they're reading a 2,000 to 3,000-year-old text and they're engaging with it, Muslims, Jews, and, and you know, Christians and Hindus, you know. Just we're probably living with our history a little more. It's, we're sort of carrying it with us a lot more, you know. So, like, the Holocaust is another one. We're gonna, I'm going to carry that, you know, with me, even though I don't have a direct connection to it, and it was 80 years ago. A lot of people don't have that. A lot of people don't have a reason, a lot of kids today, to 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 look back on the Soviet Union That's a, right. and yeah. really, you know, dig into just what made it so horrific and why it would have been so 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 much a horrific experience. I, I saw um, this film on Netflix called You People. I don't know if you've seen it, but it's um, basically a romantic comedy with Jonah Hill as, as a, a Jewish young Jewish man. He was probably a bit too old for the part, but a youngish Jewish man marrying a, a black Muslim woman. And so they were exploring identity politics and stuff. And Eddie Murphy was the father. And, you know, and I, I love Eddie Murphy, but it's, it's not a great film. But he sort of, there was this meal, you know, dinner, dinner where the parents were meeting for the first time that, that went wrong. So a classic trope in these sorts of comedies, you know. And he said, oh, but didn't your people make money off slavery, you know, uh, uh, talking about the, the, the trope that's out there now, which is not not too founded in, in you know, 
I mean, there would have been a few Jews that did, but not too, you know, yeah. it's not a big thing. But anyway, but but what I found interesting there was like, well, okay, yes, there was black slavery. We know that. That's fine. That's great. But it was interesting that it came up because, I mean, Jews were slaves. That's what the Holocaust was. Sure. <laughs> Stalin was keeping slaves. We were slaves yeah. only 80 years ago. Uh, um, Stalin was keeping slaves. World War Two was there was a lot of a slavery, lot of slavery. Happening. Well, uh, in point of fact, prior to about seventeen hundred, slavery was the rule around the world and uh, not the exception. So, uh, uh, yeah, but I mean, this is sort of I mean, it's such a huge thing, but it's sort of been that's gone from the consciousness that Jews were kept as slaves until they were executed. You know, and uh, part of that genocide. So there's all sorts of facts like that that are just being completely lost. But I, I but the thing with censorship is, and this is what Jacob sort of, I think he gets into it in the book, but we, we had quite a few discussions about this is, you know, China may emerge to be that illiberal foe that we need to define ourselves as liberal. Yeah, or you know, Putin's Russia as well. Or Putin's Russia, yeah, because yeah. when we were when we were younger, we could say we could point to the Soviet Union and say, "Those guys are oppressive. Those guys are illiberal. We're not those guys." That's right. You know, like that was the difference, and we might not have had that. I mean, uh, at the beginning of the war on terror, I think you know you had voices like you know Salman Rushdie and and Christopher Hitchens were probably wanting to remind the West and define the West off religious extremism and the uh, repression of religious extremism. But uh, that wasn't, I mean, it was sort of global, but it was terrorism. It was a little bit, it wasn't like a state like Russia or, or, or China. But It didn't have the same sense of existential threat. I, I mean, the th sense of threat was there, especially after the, the, the September 11 yeah. destruction of the World Trade Center. But it wasn't like... You could all die tomorrow in a nuclear war because of terrorists. Yeah. It, w it was more, much more sporadic than that. And it's interesting you mentioned the, the war on terror because I actually see the aftermath of the Twin Towers terrorist act as being when we started to move away from the values that underpin free speech in, in the West. I, I think the American response to it in terms of opening Guantanamo Bay and locking people up without due process and practicing mm. torture and mass surveillance and all of these things that came in in the first decade of this century really laid the ground for where we are now because it started to undermine a whole lot of fundamental freedoms that we've taken for granted you know, that we shouldn't be spied on by the state and that the state had to have evidence before it could lock us up and we had to mm. have a trial before before yeah. they could punish us and so on and that torture was right out. Even though, of course, yeah, most powerful countries have practised things like that, but they did it on the quiet, yeah. where, whereas Fantastic. this was really in everyone's faces. Mm. Well, I mean, it's another example of this free speech entropy that, you know, the US in particular has been a country that sort of enshrined free speech in its constitution, but then at various moments has been tempted to sort of move away from that. There's lots of really good examples in Jacob's book of this. I mean, the earliest one is Christianity. I mean, Christians, uh, you know, start off as this persecuted minority under the Romans, first century AD. And then by the 4th century AD, they're in power. They're, they're the official religion of the Roman Empire. And pretty soon they start turning persecutor because yes. they are the powerful ones. He's got a really, Jacob has a really good section on some Muslim intellectuals. So this person I'd never heard of before, Ibn al-Rawandi in the 9th century. He actually wrote that the Quran was a terrible book. He just sort of wrote a review of the Quran <laughs> saying this kind of sucks. And uh, he sort of survived. So apparently between the 9th and the 11th centuries, more or less, there was kind of a flourishing of free speech in Islam. And then it was only later that you have people like Hamid al-Ghazali, another person I just learned about in this book, and this Hanbali school of jurists, and they start shutting things down in the 11th century. So there's, and there's even more examples. I mean, we could talk about Luther, we could talk about John Milton. All these guys sort of started out, you know, Luther was like free speech for Protestants or, you know, emer the emerging Protestant movement. But then, not so much for Jews, because they're evil, right? <laughs> and Mil Milton was, you know, free speech for Protestants, free speech for me. He wrote the Areopagitica. Not those Catholics, though. Not those Catholics. And not, I think there's a quote uh, that he, he, even in the Areopagitica, he's writing things like free, freedom for, for the press, and he didn't, he didn't want books to have to be licensed to be published, except for books that are impious or evil, right? And, of course, that's the classic thing. How do you define, how do you define impious and evil? It's like, how do you, 
how do you define hate speech? One of the things that struck me in Jakob's book is that basically no one has been pure over free speech. Even John Stuart Mill, you know, had some exceptions. And, and the American founding fathers, having just enshrined free speech in their constitution, a few years later, about half of them wanted to suppress political opponents. Well, 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 that's, I mean, that's the power dynamic. And, and we have a little section in the in the film where we talk about, we talk about that with the, the gay community today, which is generally pro-censorship. Oh, when I say generally pro-censorship, uh, I think I've got to be careful with that because the people in power, the people who organise pride parades and are paid by the council, you know, like the people yes. in powerful positions or politicians tend to be, you know, the Joe Average gay person is probably as liberal as they've ever been. But uh, once people get into power, they sort of, you know, they do want to shut the door behind them. And it's quite a, or pull up the rope or whatever analogy you want. But it's, I find that really fascinating. They get, once they get to that destination, so often people, <laughs> you know. They change. And, but they used free speech to get there. Of that's, course. That's the sad thing. Like mm. I, I did some research on a documentary. It hasn't been produced yet, but on the gay law reform in, in 85, I mean, that was such a free speech debate in this country. It was a debate like we'd never seen. Uh, And and like one of the organisers who's based in in, in Wellington, Bill Logan, there was quite a lot of conflict between the the gay community in Auckland and activists, who a lot of them were lawyers and judges, and some of them are judges today and, you know, older men now, and the the, uh, protesters in Wellington who... And, of course, the Auckland crew were like, well, why are all these people out on the street? You know, like, it looks, it doesn't look bad. You know, let's just, let's do it behind, let's negotiate behind closed doors and that. But, I mean, their visibility was important. It was very important. I, I was in that protest when I was 17 years old with my gay piano teacher. And wow. it's, it remains one of two protests that I'm proud of having been part of. And mm-hmm. actually... It's a good example in some ways of, of how opposition strengthens you or, yeah. or strengthens your cause because the, there were people throwing bottles at us. Yeah, I, I've never been in a situation like that before or since. And, and Kiwis don't like bullies. No, that's right, exactly. And so when, when that was seen, mm. that strengthened the cause. And, you know, you could probably say something similar about the, uh, the Springbok tour protests, which, mm. which I was too young to be part of then. I, I, I Quite wanted to be, but my, my mother wasn't keen. I was fourteen, <laughs> but I, I think that you know whatever whatever one might think about that issue, the 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 fact that the there was a fair bit of police violence directed against the protesters did the, did their cause a great deal of good. Yeah, yeah. So one thing I think we should talk about actually, which is one of the, a theme a theme that keeps occurring in Jacob's book, is the so called Streisand effect. I can't remember whether he actually calls it that, but this is the idea that. Barbara Streisand, I think, didn't want certain magazines to publish pictures of her house, and bec- it was after the internet already existed. So when she did that, everybody just went online and looked for pictures of her house. Yeah. So there's this constant thing that happens where people think, oh, I can just repress free speech. I'm going to repress this very evil book, or I'm gonna, this very nasty film which has pornography in it. I'm going to repress that. And of course, everyone's as soon as they hear that, they think, oh, that sounds interesting, right? Uh, so the examples all through the book. Well, well censorship, yeah, it's an incentive. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, when I was a kid. You know, I was always interested in film and filmmaking from a young age. And, you, you know, if you were curious about films back then that, that you couldn't get your hands on, you'd go to the library, wouldn't you? And you'd go to the film section. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. you'd, you'd open up and then you'd see an image of, from A Clockwork Orange of, of Alex and the Droogs with the mask on and, mm. and everything. And you'd go, oh, what this, oh, it was banned, you read? And you think... Got to see that. I have to see that. And, and I remember the, the Orpheus Cinema in Utahuhu, South Auckland, where I was raised. Where, uh, it was a, one, a beautiful old cinema and um, with a mez and, and, and everything. And you'd go up the stairs and they'd have all the posters of past films. And they had a huge Clockwork Orange uh, poster with R20 <sighs> posted on it. And I was about 11 and I was there to watch a Bud Spencer, Terence Hill, Hill film or something like that, you know. And I saw that R20 and, and thought, what secrets does this film hold exactly. that are going to either shatter my brain and destroy me or make me a man? <laughs> exactly. Or both at once. Or both at once. <laughs> I, 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 and I became obsessed with the film. 
Yeah. And that happened with the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. It happened with the Friday the 13th film. Uh, a whole lot of stuff. Oh, even Playboy magazine. It's like, you know, yeah, Tom yeah. Cruise and Mission Impossible where he comes down on the, the wires. to we, we, used to, we, used to org- <laughs> we used to orchestrate daring assaults like that on, on, on diff- various father's bedrooms to get the, <laughs> to get the Playboy out of the, out of the closet. You know, we would take big risks. Yeah. Uh, you know, and this is this is the back in the day where you got the belt if you got caught. We would take those risks, you know, to get our hands on on censored material. Right. I, be- then, I believe you once made a film yourself that you really hoped would be censored, possibly for exactly that reason. Yeah, yeah, no, I'll tell that story. We we, we made a film. It was a thriller, and that we shot up in around ninety nine or two thousand up in Lake Alice, and we, we used it. That was our location, the old Lake Alice that had been very recently abandoned, closed down. And it, it was a thriller, and we had some pretty, you know, some dodgy stuff in it. It was a, a very much a psychological thriller and very, very edgy. Well, we thought it was quite edgy. But then it came time to get it censored because we got into the, the film festival. It was going to cost us a couple of thousand dollars and stuff. And so we did that. And I remember <laughs> me and the other filmmakers were, were hanging around going, oh, I wonder what we're going to get. I hope we've got to get at least an R16. We wanted an R18, of course, but you know, at least an R16. Not an RP16. It's got no, to be an R16. A proper one. Oh, yeah. We wanted that. And it's like, but, but then there was this, imagine if it came back an R, RP13 or something. Um, it, 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 we were distressed, we, you know, just with the thought that this, you know, badass film that we'd made could possibly just be an R13. It was driving us nuts. And then it came back with an R16 and we were like, phew. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> we're special. We're important. We're edgier than you. You know, like because like, a lot of our peers would never have made a film like that. I, w- I wonder if that's a generational thing. I, I mean, y- you and I could be broadly construed as being part of the punk generation, and it was certainly the seeking of notoriety and being yeah. outrageous was a big part of that, mm. that culture. Where, whereas now it seems a lot more wanting to blend in with the wallpaper or something. Uh, yeah, I do wonder. Um, I mean, it's a hard one to answer because I mean, you'd have to look at it all st- stratas, wouldn't you? You'd have to, you'd have mm. to really know exactly what Polynesian, how Polynesian kids True. were sort of operating in, in yeah. South Auckland. You'd, you'd have to know how rural. Ma- I mean, uh, there probably is. I mean, well, you know, there's a lot of notor- uh, notoriety today. It could be the ram raids that people are filming and and putting online. I mean, that's, you know. That's some pretty intense performance art. That, that's a true, a true thing. It is yeah. interesting, though. I think one of the things that TikTok. happens now a, a lot with the Streisand effect is, so Andrew Tate, for example, I don't think I've ever watched a single video by Andrew Tate, but yeah. I know who he is now because I hear it from the establishment. Do not watch this guy's video. And I sort of think, maybe he's terrible. I don't know. But it seems to me that that's like exactly how you get teenage boys to watch videos. Hmm. If you say, this guy's really dangerous, right? Yeah. So anyway, this, and this is something that's, you know, recurred throughout history. Well, well, well uh, Stefan Molyneux and Lauren Southern, who were the like right wing pro- provocateurs, yeah. YouTube. Pro- this is why the Free Speech Coalition came to be. You know, like we were the coalition before we were the union, mm. and we defended. When I say we defended them, we defended the right for. We defended political neutrality in public spaces. That's, That's what right. we were defending. It's a know. crucial distinction that yeah, a lot of people don't seem to get, and it seems very simple to me. But yeah. you're defending their right to have a say. You're not defending everything they've said, or any, any even no. anything they've said. You might disagree with everything they say, yeah, but you'd still defend their right a- to say. And I would yeah. disagree with probably ninety nine percent of what they say. Yeah. But but it is important because a win a win there would have been a win for everyone. It's not a win for them. It would have been a win literally for everyone uh, who wanted to hire a space. After that, but uh, you know, uh, it may even be a loss for them in some sense, right? Because uh, I can't remember who said this, but someone said, you know, the surest way of um, discrediting someone who's a fool is to let them speak. Well, what we keep it, yeah, that's right. But the, but what happened with them being cancelled is that, and, and my 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 buddy Ward Carmel, the um, he's been a broadcaster and on multi television. He said, I'd never even heard of these people, hmm. and I wouldn't have heard of these people. If if nothing, if people hadn't tried to censor them, they would have come in. They would have probably spoken to a hundred people and left, and and no one no one else would have known about it. And and as a result yeah. of the the banning, 
probably you know thousands and thousands of young people went online and 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 listened to and them. listened to them. And, they and were some in the of news. them may, may have been Con- converted, ca- captured by their their views. Well, that's right. And, and uh, Patrick Gower did a, an interview. And oh, God, that was appalling. I remember <laughs> that. Pants pulled down. Embarrassing. Bit, yeah, it wasn't good. It wasn't. So good. this is what happens. I mean, there's a really interesting historical example of this in the book. The in the states, they they brought in this thing called the Sedition Act. Pretty soon after the promulgation of the Constitution, 1798 Sedition Act, and basically the Sedition Act was you can't libel the government, and it sort of was almost like you can't criticize the government. And so, what happened with that was there were certain people that they had in their crosshairs that they wanted to ban, certain books that were being published critical of the government. And what happened was when they brought in the Sedition Act, these book sales just you know skyrocketed. And so then they sort of had to they had to repeal the Sedition Act because it was just sort of so pointless, and that's often how these free speech victories are won. I think you, you just see time and time again in history that it just doesn't work, and hopefully, eventually, even the censors themselves see that what they're doing is is being counterproductive, even from their sort of small-minded perspective. You know, from their perspective of we want to stop the ideas being out there. Hopefully, well, although there can be a lot of bloodshed before that happens. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. I think someone made the point yesterday that if 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 you know Phil Goff ultimately probably defeated the hate speech laws because his actions led to our formation and then we went from there and mutated, became the union and everything, and then sort of we ended up you know, having having that. Uh, you know, I think we can claim quite a bit of responsibility for that win. I, I agree. Um, and it all started with someone trying to censor. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So one thing I, w- I also want to talk about is this uh, Weimar fallacy. So this has been a, an argument that's often used in favor of hate speech laws that, you know, look what happened in Germany. If only there had been strong hate speech laws against sort of Nazis saying terrible things about the Jews, we wouldn't have had the Holocaust. So Jacob actually talks about this several times, both in the introduction and he, later on he has a full chapter on the Nazis. So mm-hmm. so what's the story there? Do you, do you guys well, want Well, of course, to talk the, about the, that? there were hate speech laws against the Nazis and, and a number of them were, were imprisoned as a result of those laws. That's right. So one example he talks about is this guy, Julius Streicher, which we actually mm-hmm. talked to uh, Chris Tr- the, Trotter about. The editor yeah. of uh, De Sturmer. De Sturmer, yeah. that's right. Yeah. And he was actually convicted twice for incitement to enmity. So in very similar terms to the terms which we would have in our hate speech laws if they came in in New Zealand. He was jailed for two months uh, for inciting enmity against the Jews. And at this point, again, we have the Streisand effect that his sales skyrocketed and interest in his party and in the Nazi party also went up. And, and um, what happened is, I believe, that the, the court hearings became almost like performances. You know, they were like very, they became theatrical events, mm-hmm. you know, um, and uh, he was able to gain, yeah, sympathy. And he was able also mm-hmm. to gain sympathy, exactly. Mm-hmm. So he was able to cast himself in the role of a victim, mm. which is, of course, hugely, hugely ironic considering what went down later. But in a way, he was he was sort of gifted that opportunity because the law was targeting him, and he could say, oh, I'm just you know speaking my mind, I'm being persecuted. So it was a huge win for, for those people, actually, to be persecuted in that way. I think the, the the Weimar Republic they were they were also very conscious of the the, the communists as well and, and they were. So, so it wasn't just the fascists that they wanted to do away with. That's so right. the interesting there's an interesting passage about radio in the in the book which I think is really fascinating and and especially in the, in the context of the the internet today and people wanting regulation and uh, you know the Weimar Republic uh, you know heavily regulated radio to keep both far right and far left off off the air. But of course, once the Nazis got into power, you know, it, it didn't stop them getting into power for a start. But once they got into power, the laws were in place. That's right. All they had to do is just go, <laughs> just flip and, and everyone else is banned instantly. Yeah, exactly. yeah. Like all the mechanisms were there. They didn't have to bring in a fascist regulation regime. They because just they, used what was there. The Weimar Re- Dem- democracy had done it for them. And that, they, yeah. that helped probably with legitimation. They could probably then say, look, we're not so crazy. We're just using the laws that you guys already had on the book. So we're in a way, we're continuous with the old Weimar Republic. And, and that's exactly that, that, that section in the documentary last night where Jacob talked about the, um, you know, Belarus and, and, and Putin's Russia and Turkey cut and pasting German online regulation policies and regimes or whatever policies. And, and then what can Germany do? They can't, they can't point to them and say, hey, mm. this is really illiberal what you're doing, even though they are using it in worse faith than, than the Germans would be. There's a, but it's, you've got the same law. Yeah, so, I hear yeah. that this is the case also now in Hong Kong, that there are some colonial era, i.e. British laws, that were you know, lightly against certain types of speech. And now the Chinese Communist Party is seizing on those and saying, oh, you like the British uh, regime in Hong Kong? Well, we're using that in order to 
clamp down on certain types of political speech. A hundred percent, yeah. I mean, the, the Nazis were banned outright for two years. Yes. They yeah. were banned outright mm. for two years. During uh, which time they got much stronger. They got much stronger. I think they did come... I mean, they, they sort of worked around the ban in various ways and, and found a way because, I mean, that's like, you know... Uh, I mean, they would have been like weeds, you know. They would have found a crack well, to kind of well, grow well, through. Well, this is the absurd thing about it. What, what does it mean to ban a, a, a point of view or, or, or a set of points of view or ideology or whatever? What, what are you actually banning? You can't ban what's, people, what's in people's heads. You can try to ban them saying it, but mm. you can't, yeah. you really can't only... ban every backroom conversation because yeah. you don't know about it. So no. It's like every kind of regulation. It really only targets the things that you can see or the things that you can measure. Mm. So that's why there's this powerful argument that actually what you're doing when you suppress free speech is just suppressing the things which will, would otherwise allow authorities in the mainstream public to see what's going on. Exactly. Right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, and, and you know, and, and speaking as someone uh, you know, um, like a Jewish person, uh, I would consider not being able to see this stuff a security threat. Absolutely. Like that, and, and that's what I, I think a lot of people outside of these communities may not fully grasp is like, you know, we do need to know exactly what people are thinking, saying, expressing, you know, uh, and if we don't... Uh, that's when things can... You, you get a, yeah, fal- think, a false um, idea of, of the culture then and, and, exactly. and various elements within it. I mm. think Jonathan Rock said something like hate speech laws are like trying to deal with the problem of overheating by banning thermometers. <laughs> yeah. Right. So oh, no, no, no. I think he said it's a, it, it's like dealing with global warming by oh, smashing right. all the thermometers. That's right. Yeah. So a similar image, but yeah, that, that, that's yeah. what I said. Yeah. Well, uh, Mustensa Kamar from the Ahmadiyya um, Muslim community in Wellington. He's a friend of mine, and he's been on the Free Speech Union podcast. He's a good. He's a guy that maybe you guys should speak to. He's really, mm-hmm. really, really good. I don't think he's the first to do this, but you know, he made the distinction. You know, there's speech. There's hate speech. Isn't it's not there's speech. You're, you're dealing with the speech. You're not dealing with the hate, you uh-huh. know? Exactly. And that's the yeah. important thing. The important thing is the hate, not the speech. <laughs> it's actually the hate that's the issue. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it th- something that occurs to me on the basis of what we've been talking about here is, is how actually what free speech does for a, a body politic is allow, because it allows free flow of information, it keeps everything a, a bit smoother and more continuous instead of having the potential to lurch in one direction quite suddenly because you didn't mm. see it coming. Mm. Because as you say, you know, you don't know who these people are and what they think and suddenly they emerge out of seemingly nowhere. Whereas if you have a, a, a an environment of free communication, then you know what they think and maybe there's not that many of them and there are other people to argue against them. And so you get this kind of interplay of ideas over time that just keeps things fairly steady and 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 you know as as Karl Popper would have put it you get a kind of piecemeal approach to social change instead of sudden lurches or revolutionary change which but but doesn't... but senses i think even though they may talk about protection and and things like that uh, i uh, what i think's really happening is they they want to dictate who they want to dictate change yeah that's they right. don't want an organic they don't want the culture to be to, they to, to do, they develop do, organically. They do want that. Uh, the risk they run, of course, is that they won't get the change they want. That forces that they have been trying to suppress will go stronger in the shadows and then come and get them. So, yeah. and, and and they're nor and like like back to to Weimar. They're normalizing. I'm not even though I don't think Hitler needed any encouragement, but even in our country, it would be normalizing illiberalism. You know, and and really entrenching a liberal systems and just making it so easy for the next party to do the same thing. Yeah, that's right. You know, and well, it's kind of, it's kind of interesting because we've been talking about the Streisand effect and how basically censors aren't as powerful as they think. They can't really regulate speech to the extent that they can that they think, and when they try to, it often has this reverse effect. But at the same time, it seems like when people try and repress speech and they bring in these laws. It does have a negative effect on speech, so I, I don't. I haven't really thought out myself how that sits with the with the Streisand effect. But another effect I wanted to bring up, I don't think Jakob calls it that, but I've heard it called the sort of iceberg effect. And the iceberg effect, I think, is what's happening now on campuses, which is that you know we make lists of all these examples of people being deplatformed, and sometimes people come back at us and say, 
Well, that's a very small list. The, the absolute number of deplatformings at university is quite small. But then we can look at survey evidence. You know, we can survey academics and students and say, well, no, look, when we ask them, a lot of people say that they feel inhibited. Something like, I think the Free Speech Union survey showed that something like half of New Zealand academics, or over half, feel inhibited when they talk about the Treaty of Waitangi, feel inhibited in discussing the Treaty of Waitangi. So, so there is this iceberg effect as well, and I think you can see it in history. I mean, Jacob's book talks also about the Spanish Inquisition, of course, and I remember reading this sentence in the Spanish Inquisition. In the 1240s, a study has shown they only questioned 5,471 people, and if you look at the, the uh, you know, large set of these inquisitions and questionings, only 5% of heretics were burnt at the stake. So, so you might look at that and say, well, that's, you know, there was no problem. Only 5% of people got you, burned you, at the stake. You only need to burn 5% to shut everyone else up. You probably that's only right. need to burn a couple to do that. I mean, yeah. that, that is the, the, the point, isn't it? That, you know, one person at a university loses their job and everybody else thinks, I've got a family to feed, I better shut up. Yeah, so it's a culture of dishonesty. It's like the, the whole McCarthyist idea, isn't it? It's just people will just completely shut down and the, just present a different face to the world. Well, they'll falsif falsify their own views. And yeah. I, I observed that firsthand at the university myself in many cases. The, the very people who should be the champions of public debate and, and open discourse are themselves lying about their views yeah. in public. And, and they're going along with requests to shut things down. I love, I love this historical example of the University of Paris in the 13th century. So in 1217, the Pope went to the head of the University of Paris, who was called Jan Thomas, sorry, was called Bishop Stephen Tempier, <laughs> and, and said, can you ban books by people who, which are too Aristotelian, basically? And of course, Bishop Stephen Tempier, like a good vice chancellor, agreed to this and just drew up a list of like 217 books or something that they then banned. And then in the 14th century is like, you can't use Occam's thought because that's bad and they ban that. I mean, Occam's razor is admittedly very sharp. I'm against razors in educational settings, but not metaphorical razors, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, actual ideas are less dangerous. We, than... we, we still like William of Occam in science. Yeah. Had some quite useful thoughts. Exactly. And but, well, you know, I, I'm in uh, f film and TV and written comedies and so forth and that kind of stuff. And I know a lot of actors, a lot of filmmakers. A lot of them will private message me. And some of them are people that you, know, you would even know by name. Mm. And they say, keep up the good work. You're doing really well. And I go, well, where are you? Why don't you join in? <laughs> I mean, they're like, oh, no, no, I'm not ready to do that yet. You know, like yeah. there's a lot of that. So there are so many people out there who, you know, and, and, I think there's a bit of a, I, I'm, you know, I mean, I'm happy, you know, I probably gave my character away when I talked about the poster, but I'm happy to be the bad boy, but I'm not that controversial, am I? I mean, I, I don't have not, these wacky... Not these days, probably when you were when 15. I, when I was 15, maybe. <laughs> but, you know, my views are pretty, I don't think, I'm just a sort of left-leaning workers' rights sort of guy who likes thinking about history and... Yeah. I, I'm not, I don't have any, uh, I don't think I have any wild and wacky views to uh, really. So uh, it's not even a, you don't even have to be that controversial. You, no, just, you that, just have to like liberal values. Well, actually, so, so, <laughs> that's enough to be. Absolutely. And, and, and somehow liberal values are now fascist or something. Yeah, it's, it's just bizarre. It's can very I, bizarre. Can I bring in a left wing idea here? Because this is a, yet another theme of the book, which Jacob talks about or writes about very well, is. This idea, which you see nowadays more and more, that free speech is actually against minorities. So Kim Hill brought this up in, in the film. You have that interview with Kim Hill and Jacob, and she basically says, yeah. she, she reads a, a list of email, yeah, yeah. which basically says, why is it that all the free proponents of free speech are white guys, basically, they're from the majority, and they just want to, they want to be able to tell nasty jokes about minorities. So does that, I mean, does that idea hold up in history, that it's, it's always the majority that, that's clamping down on the minority or is, is actually the other way around, that free speech has helped minorities? I, I think that idea has caught on in New Zealand a bit because it was a Itangata piece by Moana Jackson where he made that argument. And this is about uh, probably 2018. Mm -hmm. He made the argument that free speech has been used over time to entrench basically white power and to, to the detriment of minorities. What are the yeah. examples of that? Because it would seem weird, because like if you're a majority and you're, you're in a white majority country, for example, it would seem weird that you would have recourse to free speech rules, because 
like you wouldn't need them, right? Because everyone would just agree with you. If, if that's the story. The majority like, ought to be agreeing with you already. Yeah. You, you, in a democracy, you carry the day every time if you're in the majority. Mm. So then why would you need to like go to the police and say someone's you know violated my free speech laws? Well, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I think he, he, you know, he's... My he free was, speech rights, I should say. Well, he was one of those academics that, you know, I think some people on the regressive left just won't really pull apart or mm. consider too deeply. Like, he's a bit saintly for them now. But uh, I, I felt found that piece just embarrassing. And one of the most ahistorical pieces that I'd ever read, it was almost like a parody. It's like, uh, how could I as a Jew read that and think... Yeah, you know what? He's right. Free speech is bad for me. Yeah, well, so <laughs> well, I, I mean, I, you know, probably my greatest free speech hero of all time would be Ira Glasser, the, who was the president, the Jewish president of the American Council for Civil, Civil Liberties, who fought and won for the right for the Illinois Nazis to parade in in Chicago in Skokie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which was and, a town apparently and, with lots of Jewish Holocaust survivors. And, 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 and though all those lawyers, that whole team, were probably the the mm. children of Holocaust survivors. And it was survivors. because he understood perfectly that suppression of free speech was very bad for minorities, having you know the Holocaust in living memory. Uh, that's exactly right. And, and and again, he wasn't protecting Nazis; he was protecting the principle. That's just right. just like with yeah. the Stefan Molyneux, Lauren Southern thing. We were never protecting them or defending them. It was the principle, yeah. you know. Yeah. Mm. The Dreyfus affair also comes to mind, you know, the whole yeah. thing about Zola saying Jacques, basically saying mm. that there, this guy was, Dreyfus was mobbed by the sort of French Catholic majority. That also depended on free speech. I mean, the, the, mm. the ability of Zola and his supporters to get the message out there that this was a travesty of justice, that all depended on, you know, free press. Yeah, and well, the other one is, um, and, and Jacob touches on this, and I wish more people on the regressive left would <laughs> would read this, is about the First Amendment and how, I mean, what's the fascinating thing, I love the work he does on America in the book because a lot of people just think, oh, they've had free speech forever. But they didn't, did they? Oh, no. <laughs> like they were, and, and like the, the definitions, the definition that's mocked today by a lot of people who, who think it's a sort of rah-rah American thing, the... The First Amendment is as sort of sturdy as it is now because of the court cases won in the civil rights era. That's right. So, you know, we're talking, you know, black civil rights leaders and, 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 and people like that. They're the ones that sort of made. In fact, you could probably argue that it was them more than the First Amendment itself that has made America the comparatively open society it, it is or has been until very recently at least. Because actually when you look at the the history of America, and as Jakob does in his book, there has been a number of times when the First Amendment has been put into into abeyance mm -hmm. dur during the Civil War, during World War One. Yeah, World War One. C certainly, you, you could argue that uh, the McCarthyist era was a, a severe attack on it. So, mm -hmm. but, and, and yet, since the Civil Rights Movement, I, I would say that the last few years have been the first time that it's been challenged. Mm. Mm. Just on McCarthy, I read a fantastic biography of him by a, a man, a author named Larry Ty. Have you heard of this book? It's called no. Demagogue. It's a, it's a it's a big book. Yeah, <laughs> but um, it's one to get your hands on because it really looks at that McCarthy era. What was quite fascinating, I mean, I learned a lot reading it. But what was quite fascinating about that era is it was one of those. I mean, there had been communist spies within the the State Department and. and but they were not, they were kind of dealt with by the time he came along. He was really just looking for a sexy issue to really sink his teeth into because he'd been a bit of a flop for the first first term or two of his being a being a senator, and so he revived this. You know, he he was basically reviving the idea of Reds under the bed. You know, yeah. by that stage, really. But a lot of people, even in his own party, thought it was just ridiculous. They didn't like him. He wasn't that popular, but he was such a loud mouth. Mm. This almost minority of one and, and just a few people that sort of backed him were able to, to cause that much terror, just for, just through people not standing up to him. Well, he got control of that, that committee, the House Committee for Un-American Activities or whatever mm. it was called, and that, and that was the, the tribunal of the Star Chamber in which people were. Well, and the other interesting thing about him too, I mean, this is sort of a, a little off topic maybe, but I, I found it really fascinating, is before the red under the bed thing, he defended... A, he tried to make a big deal out of the way Nazi 
prisoners that, that the Americans had were being treated. So it was almost like a pre-Guantanamo thing. Right. And he was like really going into bat for these, you know, the treatment of these Nazi prisoners. And th- that just was a Led Zeppelin, you know, it just yeah. <laughs> went down like a lead balloon. And so he's like, oh, okay, well, that one didn't work. So he was he was just a loud mouth. Looking for a platform. Looking for a platform. And but um, It's interesting how that often works in history. It's it's the a very sort of energized, intolerant minority can have an outsized effect. And yeah. um, I mean, I say this with respect to the greatness of the Christian cultural heritage, but I mean, that that's kind of the story of late antiquity with the Christians, that they're quite small, but they're just, they're much more intolerant of other religions than the pagans were, because the pagans were kind of like polytheism, your God is kind of like my God. And the Christians were just like, no, that's not the way it is. Um, and they had an outsized effect. And I think in universities, we're seeing something similar, that it's really a sort of small elite, but, you know, they, they have power and the, also you know people just do get scared if you if, if people think that someone's going to go on twitter and get them fired for something they've said that's very that's very frightening and they've seen it happen before so so well, this, here, here's here's another point about the the idea that free speech is bad for minorities I, I think there's a kind of weird thing about what's happening at the moment that i'm not aware of having been a feature of other assaults on free speech in the past there may be instances of it but i can't i can't think of them which is that the ideological forces that have now taken over the universities and I would say the public service and have made serious inroads into big corporations think of themselves as minority victims or at least as standing up for minority victims when actually they are the hegemonic force at the moment by dint of the fact that they control the institutions. Well, well, I think, you know, Moana Jackson, when he's writing that piece, he... Uh, Jacinda Ardern has, has just been elected. Uh, I know that they say that hate speech laws were put on the table because of March 15th. Not true. Mm-hmm. The Human Rights Commission was pushing them in 217. Uh, he was he was part of the elite by that stage. This wasn't the Moana Jackson of, of you know who really blew the lid on the criminal system for Maori. You know he made some great contributions there. Yeah, <laughs> and he needed free speech to do that. That's right. You know. But uh, he was another guy, you know, closing the door behind him. But yeah, but but because he he was in power by that stage, yeah, he had that mana. You know, he he was a person people were going to listen to, and not everyone was going to question because you know he he'd, he'd become a bit of a saintly academic at, by that stage in his crowd. But no, I mean, I just found that piece just a historical. It just made no sense, and and I mean. A lot of people have brought it up and said, Moana Jackson said, you know, and they, they, they'll post the link to this. And I go, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've read that one before. It's just nuts. So it's what do we right. think? Is, so we, we, do we find this idea helpful that Jakob has, which is another big big uh, topic of his book, is so-called elite panic, right? And he says that el- el- elite panic tends to erupt when the public sphere is suddenly expanded by the introduction of a new technology. So one of his examples is the printing press during the Reformation, newspapers and coffee houses in the 18th century, the telegraph in the 19th century, and maybe now the internet. Yeah, well, I mean, a, a new way of promulgating discourse always changes the way discourse takes place. And so the internet has massively facilitated everybody getting in touch with everybody else, you know, in, in the past, mm. unless you had access to the, the, the print media or you know, even more unlikely, the, the television media, or you just couldn't reach a mass audience, yeah. whereas now anyone can theoretically reach a mass audience. So I do, I do see a, a little bit of elite panic a, among you know mainstream journalists who, I mean, in the past, I think they did a fairly good job. They were less biased than I think they are now. But they also had this role as gatekeepers, and they, they could use that you know, very effectively just to sort of shut people out of the public sphere. And I think that now there is nasty stuff out there, there's no doubt in my mind, but at the same time, it's kind of a good thing that these gatekeepers can be got around so so easily. And I think that's one of the reasons why suddenly you have this revanchist thing from the elites that, no, no, we need to stop people speaking. We need to stop people posting things. I mean, I find the idea of disinformation even more chill or misinformation even more chilling than hate, the idea of hate speech to, to an extent because that's, that's about controlling a, a narrative that will lead to various policy outcomes. So... The idea, for example, that climate deniers should be shut up or or people Mm. who are sceptical of COVID vaccines should be shut up because that's disinformation as defined by the government. Now, maybe the government is right. I I, I mean, you know, 
climate change is, is, is a thing and, you know, the vaccine, well, that's a, a more debatable thing in, in my mind, but whatever, we should be able to obviously talk about it. And again, in a democracy, all points of policy have to be up for debate. And as you said at the outset, Dane, nothing is settled. No, nothing mm. can ever be thought of as settled if there's anybody who disagrees because they have a right to say... It's a voice they disagree with. And new information comes all the time. And new information. And And this is the lesson of science, of course. I mean, as a a scientist, when people say the science is settled, it just makes my blood boil because absolutely that's antithetical to any philosophy of science worth its salt because every theory is contestable. That's the point. And and when that new information turns up, I mean, it's not always going to turn up, but when it does... The credibility of those in power is just reduced to nothing. It's sh- shattered. <laughs> so yeah. they would have been better to be humble. That's at right. The outset, and say, but well, this is the best evidence we've got now, but you know, and we're going to act on that because we have to act. But we're, our ears are open for new information coming to light, and we'll, we'll navigate that as it comes. Far better discourse than the podium of truth. You know. Yeah. yeah no. Okay. I mean. It, I, I mean, a lot of this to me, I think, is about uh, just once you're in power, you want a cushy ride. Mm-hmm. You you don't want to do the hard policies. I mean, because what's the core issue in New Zealand? And what's what's been the core issue for a long time? We're a low-wage economy with <laughs> house prices that are just absolutely nuts, mm-hmm. right? Now, I don't care who you are. If you can't solve that issue, you're a failure as mm-hmm. a leader. I don't care if you're left, right, somewhere in between. That's the issue, right? But we're not talking about that as much as we should. Mm. We're talking about misinformation. We're talking about the need for censorship. We're talking about the need to control and shut down, I think, and this is the lefty in me coming out, people in low-wage jobs who can't get into homes. Mm -hmm. You know, that's where this all leads, you know. They're, They're just too difficult to deal with. It's it's the too hard basket. Yep. You know, we don't want to deal with it. You're you're, you're and, and these are the unwashed. These are the parliamentary protesters. A lot of them, not That's all right. of them, but mm. it's that type of person. Yeah. You know, and you know they're cynical and negative. I mean, the disinformation project. One of their key words that indicate you know ooh, what's going on here: authoritarian. If people use authoritarian to describe the government in a post, you know that's a red flag for them. I mean, that's a complete... You should be able to call a government authoritarian. Obviously. With, yeah, without <laughs> being called a nutbag, a fahar writer, uh, uh, someone that needs to be suppressed. Yeah. I, I mean, the idea that, like, let's suppress all the people that don't like the government is basically what that says. It's lucky that the disinformation proce- project is such a clown show or, or would be in big trouble. Well, they probably yeah. would say, you're allowed to criticise the government, you just can't say things that are false, like that they're tyrants. But I agree with you that it's a, a very kind of blurred boundary, because I, I agree, like, things like the lockdown, you might think that they're authoritarian in some sense, which I think they sort of clearly were. You might think that's justified. But Locking just people because in their you, houses is authoritarian, yeah. whether you think it's justified or not. Right, right. And just because you call it authoritarian, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're saying it's the same as Stalinism. I mean, mm. and even if you do, I mean, even if someone out there thinks that the government has been as bad as Stalin, I mean, again, we go back to the rest of this whole conversation about free speech. Okay, I think that's wrong. I think that's kind of offensive. It's obviously not as bad as Stalin or Hitler. But what do you gain from sort of punishing people for, or, you know, censoring people or punishing people for saying things like that? Well, I mean, uh, as yeah. we've seen, what, we, what you probably get is that that person gets a few more followers on their social media because now they're a victim. Yeah, exactly right. You know, if, we, if you look at what, how Jacinda Ardern left office, yeah, you can say that a lot of the COVID policies were justified. But I think she did overstep the mark. She didn't leave room, and this is what Eleanor Catton said on um, in, in the Phil Matthews interview on Stuff, which I thought was a really, really good, really good interview. She came across really well. It was uh, really interesting to to read. You know, she said, you know, there was no room for difference or dissent in that policy. You have to leave room for difference or dissent. I think the watershed moment was when she deliberately c- created an underclass with the vaccine mandate. Yeah, the mandate did not need to happen. You know, uh, go out there, you know, 
Persuade, don't persuade, force. Persuade, make everyone, you know. But, of mm. course, and then they played that game of, well, no, it's still your choice. You just won't have a job at the end of yeah, it. Yeah, that's right. You know, and I mean, You won't be able to go on. out and, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, no, no. And, and I mean, did we, we were all going to get it anyway, weren't we? We, were we all, we all did. It. We all got it. So it didn't, <laughs> who did it help? So, you know, I, you know, she, this cost her the, the leadership. I think it probably did. I think and it really played a big role. And people say, okay, no, she made her own choice. Yeah, but after being hammered. Well, that and hate speech, I think. <laughs> yeah, well, the liberal policies, well, yeah. I mean, I think there was an own goal in it. And, you, you know, and that's democracy. She mm. she made some wrong calls and yeah. in the end paid the price. Yeah, uh, but, you know, how many, uh, not too many media commentators are going to really accept that. <laughs> oh well, that's that's why free kiwis exist. Well, that's right, and that's why. Well, see, and the free speech but union. See, exactly right. You know, if the, if people don't have the debate, what happens? I make a film. Yeah, you make a podcast. Uh, uh, we're going to put together a um, blog. Me and um, David Kuman, we're going to put together a blog, and I'm going to tap both your shoulders. Yeah, excellent. And, and we've got about twelve writers already, and because we want as much content as we we can get. What a good thing. We'll, we'll be in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, def- I definitely think it's really weird the way that. Uh, that certain people in the elite and other sectors have chosen now to, to sort of try and clamp down on speech because now is the time we have the best sort of technology for just ignoring them. And, you know, the, you can't publish this in this journal. Okay, I'll publish it online. You know, it's just so easy. But I guess this just sort of reiterates Jacob's point about this sort of elite panic in times of technological expansion because it was the same thing in the Reformation. You know, the Catholic Church was like, you can't write that, Luther. He's like, I'm just going to pin it to a church door. I've got a printing press. I can just publish these books. People can read them everywhere. Mm. So I think it's something very similar going on now. There's, there's this desperate attempt to shut down debate, and everyone's just like, okay, you ban me from Twitter? I'll go to this other social media site. Yeah, it, it, it's just, a, it's a, well, it's an incentive to create more work. So, it, <laughs> you know, it's just it's self-defeating. Yeah. It definitely is, yeah. So this has been great. We've just gone past an hour, so we should probably wrap up. I kind of okay. feel like we, we've been talking about so much about the problems of free speech and the threats to it that I kind of want to end on a high, and I've got this little subheading here, free speech progress, because there is also a story in Jacob's book that things have gotten better over time, not in a kind of linear way that they've never slipped back. Ups because and that's, downs, but a general yeah, That's the whole problem trend. with free speech yeah. entropy. But, you know, there are all these things in this book that I didn't really know much about before. Um, he's especially well-placed to talk about some of the Scandinavian stuff, Scandinavian history where, where in which uh, free speech has played a large role. He writes about the establishment of the Dutch Republic in 1581 or the Union of Utrecht where freedom of religion is in its founding charter. People like Dirk Kornhert, who's a kind of free speech hero I'd never heard of. He also reminded me of people like Spinoza, who have very free speech, John Locke in England. And then uh, these guys who wrote Cato's letters, John Trenchard and Thomas Gordon. I want to name these people because I think they should be more remembered. Mm. And uh, they were responsible for this phrase, that freedom of speech is the great bulwark of liberty uh, in, in, their, in their publication called Cato's Letters in, in the London Journal, which was in the sort of 1720s. And that was later taken up by the, by the American revolutionaries and by the people who framed the American Constitution. And I think it's a great way of thinking about it. I mean, I think free speech is the great bulwark of liberty because, and the great bulwark of democracy too, because if the, every, the ordinary people can't have their say, they can't have an impact on politics and they can't defend themselves. I would say that... It, even if you have voting and free elections, without free speech, you do not have democracy. In fact, I think it is more important to democracy than voting. I think to to really be a free speech advocate, you need humility too. Mm-hmm. You need to know that people that you disagree with will be, they may get in your face and share a message you don't want to hear. But you're defending their right to do that. And sometimes so that will t- takes, they will teach you something as well. Sometimes they'll teach you something. But that takes patience, that takes tolerance, that takes a humility. So I think there's a character to the free speech advocate or free speech that is really important. You know, when you look at people like who defend free speech today and the, well, even, you know, Christopher Hitchens, who who passed away over a decade ago now, very influenced by Orwell. And what was that influence? Intellectual honesty. Yeah. You know? That's, that's the influence that, that a Salman Rushdie or, or a Christopher Hitchens take. And that's the influence I take from those guys. I want to be intellectually honest. I don't have to be the smartest man in the room, but I want to be honest intellectually. That's what I want to be. And that will take, that takes humility, you know. And I don't always get there, but, you know, but that's, that's what I 
strive to be. That's the that's the banner that we we always look to is is that yeah. honesty and, and and openness. And and I've got to say, Dane, you know, coming back to your film, that that came across strongly. The the honesty of giving the opponents of free speech or the 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 friends of hate speech legislation the floor to say their piece fully. Yeah, well, that that means a lot to me mm. because that that was you know if I'm making a documentary and if I wasn't to do that then I I wouldn't want to make another documentary or I'd want to make another one and get it right because I I don't I mean it's very easy to get your own ideas and be so full of your own certain so be so certain mm. that you go out and just decide that you know everyone you just grab a cookie cutter and just bang it over everyone you meet and then film that you know like no. You know, it's it's just I want to hear what people have to say. Yeah, and I think that that value has come through also at the Free Speech Union events that I've attended, where occasionally there are people who stand up, and I've got to be honest, I, I some, they start speaking, and I feel a little bit embarrassed. I mean, they're by no means the majority. I mean, most people have pretty pretty mainstream views, I would say. A few things so make your skin crawl a bit. Yeah, a few, a few sort of happens, mar- yeah. marginal calls, and I and I sort of think. But the thing is, it's it's not just so. Sometimes there's the experience where your opponent can teach you things, and you think. Oh, I kind of re- reassessing the way I view the world, and that's a strong argument, and that's very, very important, and that's probably the, the main thing that's a benefit to free speech. Um, but there's also this thing that even if somebody says something that you think is completely nuts, maybe someone's saying to you, "Oh, you know, Bill Gates is manipulating us via 5G because he's put chips in the vaccine or something." E- even that, like, I wouldn't want to suppress and repress because I kind of think there's interesting information there. There's at least the information that this other human being this sort of valuable human being in front of you has been led to believe these things. And why is that? And you might want to explore that. You know, why are they so, why do they feel so disgruntled? Why do they feel, why have they been led to think in that way? Why do they hold that distrust? Yeah. What clues are in the conspiracy that might, that, that might end up being breadcrumbs back, right. back to the source of that distrust? Where does it lead to? You know, that's, that's the, that's well, the question uh, that I had, and that's what we can learn out of it. Yeah. A lot of the time, and I, I, I spent quite a bit of time wandering around the parliamentary protests, talking to people, and a lot of them were just perfectly mainstream people from the poorer communities, I would add, but a lot of them had lost their jobs. There were teachers, nurses, etc., who had been disenfranchised by the mandate. But mm. There were also some people there who believed what I thought were some pretty strange things, and the thing that really struck me about every one of them is how alienated they were. Yeah. And that was the message that I got from those kind of odd conspiracy theories. It was not the content of the theory itself, but a kind of cry for help, actually. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. And, I mean, you may have intuitively known that going in, but being standing across from a person like that. I mean, where I struggle is with, you know, the uh, people that are anti maori language, you know, like, you know, that that's a pet, because I work for so long, basically in language revitalization because I was making documentaries that would screen on Maori TV. All the funding we got was were really language strategies that it was a convenient excuse to make a TV show. And, you know, I, I was quite foreign to the, the whole concept of language revitalization and went on a journey myself. You know, I was exposed to ideas that influenced me and I understand the importance of it now in a way I was never anti it, but I would have probably just dismissed it and gone, oh, well, is it, is it that big a deal? Or if you want to learn, just go and learn. What's the problem? You know, like th- that sort of attitude, you know. And so when people say, I support free speech, and my concern is I don't want to read a sign in Māori, like, you know, that, that, I, I find that a bit of a tough one because to me, te reo Māori is almost where the rubber meets the road too. I mean, it, you know, we need space for this language, you know. Like we need to be able to, and, and again, I mean, pe- people, I don't think they're losing much by having to, to, to confront a sign or I, I, two I basically Maori. I basically agree with you. Where, where I think that there has arisen an issue with that quite recently is when it becomes kind of compulsory. So, for example, I, the, I think it's the Ministry for Education basically said that their staff must use Māori greetings. And that, now, that's compelled speech. Yeah, that's so, compelled speech. So and that's... I, I, I disagree with that. People should be allowed to use the language of their choice. You know, I mean, obviously you want to use a language that other people will understand. Mm. And everybody understands both kia ora and hi there. Mm. And people should be able to make a choice between those kinds of greetings. But beyond that, I... I when I was in elementary idea. school in Montreal, they made me speak French. 
uh, every other day. So that was also terrible. I mean, that's a silly example because it's a very educational setting. And I guess my parents signed me up for that. So right. I had to do it. And actually, <laughs> looking back now, I, <laughs> looking back, I think that was probably a good instance of compelled speech because now I can understand French. And I've, I've, I've forgotten how to speak it actively very well, but I can still understand it. Okay, so anyway, I've just gone against everything we said. But... Um, <laughs> But like the but the tolerance issue for me is like if you know there, there's almost like a fear from some that they're losing their own identity and language, you know, and it's not an onslaught. I don't think anyone could call it an onslaught. But I mean, just imagine how many Maori would feel, you know. Well, they nearly very nearly did lose their language they, and culture, and exactly yeah. right. So it's like I would, but you know, but those again, if they want to get up at at, at an event and and say that. If we were to say, sit down, we don't want to hear from you, I disagree with that. But, uh, is that going to make him warmer Obviously to Māori language? No, quite. <laughs> I, mean, I, I do think that, yeah, I mean, I've heard various sort of columns to the radio when uh, presenters use like, little things at the beginning, like Kiora and, you know, what their name is in Māori and stuff. And some of the emotional temperature on the columns reminds me of a kind of Twitter pylon. Yeah. So, you know, so, I, yeah, I, I find it a bit puzzling as well. But. Well, someone just needs to actually uh, engage, I think, and say, and maybe I'll try that next time. Or maybe, and, like, and, and maybe say, you don't want to try it. What is distressing that, you? That, that, that mm. person wants to say it, so that's, and you don't want to say it, so that's fine. Like, that's kind of where I stand. If someone else wants to use pronouns, for example, and I don't want to s- introduce myself pronouns, live and let live. Live and let live, yeah. yeah. And that's the sort that, of that. fundamental principle of free speech uh, and liberalism. Live and let live. But but yeah. but I guess what I'm saying is like a lot of our supporters do need to internalize the stuff themselves as well. You we, know, we like, all need to constantly we, work on internalizing. We all it. need to do that. You know, we all need to think: Why am I upset about what's being said? Is this criticism, or am I trying to shut shut this person down? Or just acknowledge you know? you're upset and deal with it. Yeah. It's like fine. Okay, mm. so I feel offended, or I feel hurt by that, or whatever. It's only words. Yeah. yeah. And live and let live, of course, not only a key principle of liberalism, but also a cracking track by Guns N' Roses. That, that was for you, Dane, because you were sitting there wearing a Kiss t-shirt. Maybe Guns yes. N' Roses may be a bit late for you. But hey, I got a Kiss uh, yeah. story just before we leave. Did you know the, the two S's on Kiss are banned in Germany? I'm not surprised. Oh, yeah, they look kind of... When um, you look at them now, because they look like yeah. the SS, of they course. Do, they do. I, I wouldn't have noticed that. I'd never noticed that before you said that, but now that I look at it... Well, yeah. Paul Stanley and Gene Simmons are Jewish. That's right. Oh, and right. so yeah. they, you know, but of course, Ace Fraley, who collects Nazi memorabilia, he came up with the logo back in the 70s. Mm. But now, <laughs> do you think Germany is right for demanding that the KISS logo be different in Germany because of this SS connotation? I think they're misguided to ban Nazi insignia and so on. I mean, perfectly understand why they did, but... Mm. Again, it's the same set of issues. You, yeah, you're just suppressing something that won't go away because you suppress it. And uh, I, I mean, the far right could come back in Germany. It would not surprise me at all. Well, and they would mm-hmm. probably be helped by things like that. Like if yeah. you, then they could very uh, easily present that as kind of a ridiculous clamping down on free speech. And a lot of people would probably be like, "Yeah, that's stupid." You know? Well, this T-shirt I'm wearing is really that. You know, I mean that that whole kiss emblem story really shows how quickly censorship can just tip into the absolutely absurd. Mm. That's right. <laughs> it should also be Kuss in Germany. Uh, so, yeah. Anyway, we should probably end there. On that note. So thanks very much, Dan, for coming in. And no I, uh, we, I should Enjoy say it. at the end, I'd recommend all the, our listeners Jakob's book, Free Speech, A Global History from Socrates to Social Media. So great.